Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the fourth in a series of the talks of Lionel Corbett. Today, our talk is The Problem of Evil. And I'm here today with my good friend and colleague, Dr. Gart Jameson, my good friend and colleague, Dr. Will Lin. And I will welcome you now to Lionel Corbett. Lionel. Thank you, Nina. Good morning. I'm going to talk about some psychological uh, approaches to the problem of evil, um, bearing in mind that I don't think we can come up with a single overarching theory that, co that covers every type of evil because it has too many forms and contexts. Um, and I want to make the point that in any given situation of evil, we always have to look at a combination of factors, psychological factors and social factors, in order to understand it. Before I uh, launch into that, I, I do want to acknowledge <clears throat> the fact that some people believe that evil really cannot be understood, that it's too horrible to be uh, to be understood, that it's, that it's beyond reason, it's beyond explanation. Those people say it's impossible to understand how someone can carry out an act like the cold-blooded murder of children or something like that. Now, there is a concern sometimes that people have, which is that if we give a, a psychological or social account of evil, um, we somehow imply that the act is not really evil. And, and we remove the perpetrator's responsibility as if they were responding to these pressures from, the, from society and from inside their own mind. Um, so for example, we might say that if the evil doer is severely abused in childhood, then he's less responsible for his actions. I think this is a, not a realistic fear because I don't think that if we understand an evil action, we, that is the same as pardoning it or condoning it or diminishing the horror of the action. I think we can do all of those. We can, we can understand an action and not condone it at the same time. By understanding an action psychologically, we don't bypass the moral dimensions of evil. It's true that when, when we can demonstrate major developmental trauma, like uh, abuse and abandonment and so on in childhood, in the childhood of a person who commits evil actions, th these might be mitigating factors. They, they may not be total explanations, but they might be mitigating factors. Uh, this is sometimes called the abuse excuse. But of course, this is not an entire explanation because we know that some people have horrendous childhood environments and do not do evil. And we don't want to lessen the reality of evil by giving it a psychological explanation. We don't want to condone evil by saying it's always due to mental illness of some kind. So we can understand and morally condemn evil behavior at the same time. But there is always the question of the degree of personal responsibility that an evil person has when they were severely traumatized in childhood. Now, there are some uh, uh, psychologists and philosophers who just want to get rid of the word evil altogether because they say it has traditionally religious connotations. Uh, and I'll say a little bit about that later on. For example, psychologists who were materialists will say that the notion of a devil as in the devil made me do it, is really just the projection of an intrapsychic process. It's the projection of the shadow onto this mythical figure. And the word sin, as used in, in traditional religions, is really just a way of avoiding very complex human motivations that are driving evil behavior. For example, um, well, I came across a, a case like that recently, a man who, um, used to have uh, panic, severe panic attacks, and he couldn't tolerate uh, being alone when he, when he started to get very, very anxious. So he, w he became sexually promiscuous, um, mainly in an attempt to have somebody to be with, so to comfort him, to hold him, to soothe him, to calm him. But uh, his minister, when I saw him, his minister had told him that this behavior was, the sexual behavior was sinful. But he wasn't sinful. He was trying to hold himself together. So this is one of the reasons that a lot of psychologists want to get rid of words like sin. Um, 
Now, we can begin uh, by trying to understand evil in terms of obvious conscious factors until we get to the unconscious factors. The, the conscious factors are things like envy, uh, narcissistic grandiosity, the need to enhance oneself at the expense of other people, the desire to have more for oneself relative to other people, the desire for power, very common cause of evil, a threat to one's image of oneself. Um, hatred of those who who wants, who seem to have more than one has extremism politically and religiously fundamentalism the belief that there's a single absolute truth the violent hatred and rejection of people who are different than oneself and so on but the question for the psychologist is where do these harmful mental states come from they're very damaging, but where do they come from? What are their sources in the psyche? Well, many people nowadays think that this kind of evil behavior um, begins with developmental failures in childhood. Emotional deprivation in childhood leads to a fragile sense of self. Um, deprivation and fragility because of abuse and neglect in childhood predisposes to the development of negative complexes which are characterized by hostility and aggression and envy and hatred and grandiosity and it turns out that that kind of behavior which causes a tremendous amount of evil is actually an attempt to prevent fragmentation this kind of hostility and aggression is a way of holding oneself together when, when one is fragile. In other words, the absence of goodness in childhood doesn't remain an absence. It can lead to very destructive complexes. It's as if uh, abuse and neglect in childhood allows evil behavior to arise that otherwise would never occur. And once this kind of uh, a behavior takes hold, the individual becomes caught in a kind of escalating cycle of behavior that's very difficult to control and very harmful to the individual and to other people. There are, of course, positive forms of child abuse, like deliberate sadism towards children and cruelty. And there are what you might call negative forms of, uh, of uh, abuse experienced in childhood, resulting from neglect or parental ignorance or unavoidable abandonment and deprivation in which case the origin of evil is really more tragic than malevolent well we may all have the potential uh, have the core of potential to commit evil because we all have pockets of early infantile trauma we all have what are called persecutory internal objects. We all have a shadow or negative complexes, but most of us can contain this sector of the personality without acting it out. Why do some people act it out? Why can they not contain it? Apparently it's because the emotional intensity of, of this kind of material becomes too great and it overflows into action and can't be contained. I'll come back to that. Let me just, uh, before we go into that, let's just say a word about the nature of evil. What is evil? As I said at the beginning, we can't define evil precisely because whenever you try to define evil precisely, you, you tend to talk about certain types of evil, but you leave out other types of evil. Another problem is that at different periods of history, different cultures have had their own ideas about evil. Social values change. Uh, it took a long time, but eventually society realized that slavery was an evil, but for a long time it wasn't considered to be an evil. Now, a common sense definition of evil would include whatever produces human sorrow and suffering, whatever inflicts needless harm on people, whatever is unnecessarily destructive or senselessly violent. Um, whatever curtails personal growth is evil, whatever reduces human potential, whatever destroys relationships. These are common sense definitions of evil, um, especially if this kind of behavior is motivated by hatred or by envy or by greed or by revenge or the abuse of power. Now, one of the questions that arises here is, 
are there absolute standards of evil or is what we call evil entirely relative is evil only a matter of human judgment or what a particular society says is evil perhaps evil behavior is just whatever we regard as horrifying or is there an archetypal level of evil a transpersonal level of evil as we see in mythologies of the devil or in Jung's notion of the dark side of the self which I'm going to talk about a little bit if there is a transpersonal level of evil if there is archetypal evil then maybe evil has some kind of teleological purpose to it another question is does evil have intrinsic properties does evil have a kind of essence or is evil only a matter of human behavior is evil behavior always the result of psychopathology or social pathology or is there a level of evil that defies explanation if there is a kind of supernatural level of evil the dark side of god or something like that then uh, it cannot be fully understood by human beings and we couldn't deal with it without transpersonal help in contrast if you think that evil is only a matter of individual pathology or social pathology then we don't even need the word evil we can just describe bad behavior we can just say this behavior is cruel or it's sadistic let's not use the word evil evil is then just a, a, a descriptive term for bad behavior that we don't like it's not really a noun it's an adjective it doesn't have independent ontological existence and that's a big debate in the literature some people think that there is such a thing as objective ontological levels of evil one of the complaints here is that if you describe a, a human being as evil it's inherently demonizing <clears throat> and it would be better to use a specific term like <clears throat> like to say that this person is cruel or hateful the counter argument is that if if you don't use the word evil you may minimize the gravity of the phenomena that you're trying to talk about and some people think we need a word like evil to express the kind of horror and revulsion that we feel when we see a really evil act well then what's the difference between something which is evil and something that's just wrong where do we draw the line it might be wrong to park in front of a fire hydrant or something but you wouldn't call it evil but where do we where do we draw the line here can we distinguish between something that's truly evil and something that's just selfish or bad how do we distinguish true evil from ordinary human failings which we all have i think we do need a word that that uh, conveys a special quality that's more than just destructive because evil acts have a special quality their nature is appalling it fills us with a kind of revulsion and disgust um it's it's a visceral feeling and i think we could use the word evil when an action has that especially horrific quality so when you call a person evil you're actually condemning the person in a very special way you're not just saying the person is immoral or, or selfish or something like that but then the question arises well is evil a quality of a person or is it only the quality of an action in other words is the person evil is or is only what the person does evil there's a distinction is the essence of the person evil or is only his or her action evil another problem here is can an evil act be carried out by somebody who doesn't have an evil character could you have a, a an evil character but not be in a situation that allows you to do evil but you're still an evil person in other words suppose you're adolf hitler but you never come to power so you have an evil character but you couldn't do what you did politically could you still say that person is evil be the point is that if you say a person is evil you are condemning what he is not simply what he does uh, and it's possible that such a person could be evil but never have the opportunity to carry out an evil action it's also possible that a, an ordinary person 
could commit an evil action that's out of character under very unusual circumstances. I'm going into this in some detail because I think it's important to be clear about the nature of evil. It's not a simple question. Uh, I find that politicians, for example, will use the word evil much too readily. Reagan talked about the evil empire and Bush talked about the axis of evil. But these are examples of the word being used in a very simplistic, sort of self-righteous kind of way. And to call other people evil like this is to imply that we're entitled to attack them. We are all good and they are demonic. That kind of very primitive splitting is a very primitive defense. And once we start calling people we don't like evil, the problem is that we stop trying to understand them and we oversimplify the nuances of our relationship with them. Well, there are complications even further here. There are people who say that um, an evil action is an action which is pleasurable, which is wrong, but also pleasurable that for the perpetrator, that the perpetrator takes pleasure in it. This is an unnecessary criterion. You could do evil without enjoying doing evil, but there are people who enjoy doing evil. But there are lots of people, especially psychopaths, who do evil, they cause intentional harm, but they really feel nothing. For them, other people are just a nuisance who get in the way. And these are often people who carry out evil without much feeling of any kind. But there are what are called moral monsters. Moral monsters are truly evil characters who do evil because the action is wrong. They take pleasure in the wrongness of the action and they show no morally appropriate guilt or shame or regret. They're fairly rare, but they, these moral monsters do exist. Um, but, you know, if you just pursue your own interest and desires at the expense of somebody else, you're not necessarily doing evil for its own sake. Some people are just thoughtless and indifferent to other people. And these people are often called moral idiots rather than moral monsters. Uh, there is a school of thought that says evil is just a term that we use to describe someone we don't like and who scares us. And uh, people that we don't understand, we tend to call evil. And once you understand somebody and why they're doing what they're doing, they may not actually appear to be so evil. Now, I've said that we can define evil in terms of the intentional infliction of pain and suffering on another person causing harm unnecessary harm to another person. But it's not enough to define evil in terms of harm and suffering caused to another person. Because you might be evil without causing suffering. You might enjoy the suffering, enjoy watching the suffering caused by other people. And the word harm is a very broad term. It, it could refer to any form of pain or suffering. So the harm really has to be very considerable for the action to be considered to be evil. Uh, and if you, if you, the problem is if you define evil in terms of causing harm, you don't take into account motivation. What's driving the behavior? You may be an evil person, but as I said, you may never have the opportunity to cause any harm. For example, suppose you're a paralyzed person and you live silently, but you just enjoy spitefully watching other people suffer. Take joy in watching other people suffer. You might still be an evil person, even though you're not causing any harm. So the criterion of causing harm is not sufficient to make one an evil character. Similarly, of course, you might cause harm without any intention of doing so. So I think we should drop the harm criteria. Well, what about insane people? What about people who, who kill and, and so on because they're actually mentally, severely mentally ill or psychotic? I think a horrific act by an insane person should be thought of as like a natural disaster, something like an earthquake or a volcano. It's not really evil if the person has a deranged brain and is not morally responsible for what they're doing. Usually we say that to be described as evil, the perpetrator must act knowingly, with foresight, with prior deliberation, with planning. 
we don't call something evil it's if it's just the result of recklessness or negligence. So the motive has to be something like racism or sadism. The person who commits an evil act in a moment of weakness or frenzy is not necessarily an evil person. Uh, you may do something like that without having an evil constitution or without having an evil character. I'd prefer to think of an evil person as somebody who repeatedly acts as a, in an evil way, not just somebody who does something once. Because it's possible to do an evil act out of character, not typical of one's usual behavior. So I think the word repeatedly is important here. There are other definitions. The, the deliberate destruction of human dignity is evil. Uh, the misuse of power is often evil. Um, anything which is uh, violence carried out for no reason might be considered to be evil. Um, but we can't equate evil with just aggression itself because there are evil actions that are more subtle and more complicated than just aggression or violence or destructiveness. Any kind of exploitation or oppression of other people could be considered to be evil. To use another person for one's own benefit could be considered to be evil. To use force to humiliate or destroy another person, of course, would be evil. But violence alone is not an adequate criterion. There are people who are psychologically cruel, but they're not particularly violent. Um, now, I've heard people who are, who are like that, who who've said to me uh, with a straight face and meant it, the devil made me do it. Do we need a mythic approach to evil? Do we need a concept of the devil or the demonic? Well, um, a lot of people today say, no, we can replace this theological notion of the devil with psychological categories of harmful behavior. We just call somebody sadistic or cruel. Evil behavior is really a set of symptoms, uh, especially if you're a materialist who doesn't believe in a spiritual dimension and you just see the universe as neutral or indifferent to human beings, then evil is just unpleasant reality. It's just aspects of reality that we don't like but it's a part of the way things are and using words like devil and evil is just mythology or superstition terrible events like earthquakes are just what are called that natural evil are just part of the natural order they have no moral qualities uh, behavior can be dangerous, it can be harmful, but the word evil is really just a personified way of talking about horrifying behavior. But there are other people who say no, we need mythic notions like the Christian or Jewish notion of the devil, because we want a word that conveys the intensity. We want something that conveys the fact that evil can have a transpersonal quality. It's not purely human. It has an archetypal level. Mythic images give evil a special meaning. Um, notions like the devil in this point of view uh, are useful because they capture the imagination. They preserve the element of mystery. Um, think of the story of the Gorgon or the Medusa whose face turned people to stone. This, by the way, you remember that um, um, uh, the Medusa or, uh, was a priestess in the temple of Athena and uh, she was uh, either had an affair with Poseidon the god or was raped by Poseidon in the temple of Athena uh, and, and she was very famous for her beautiful hair and Athena got in such a rage because Medusa was supposed to remain a virgin that she um, uh, turned her into a gorgon who, with hair that became snakes and her face turned people to stone. This is a very good example of somebody who becomes evil as a result of the, as the victim of violence. And then the story goes on to say that um, 
that uh, um, Athena gave Perseus a shield so that he could approach Medusa as a reflected image rather than directly. And the myth seems to say that sometimes you, it's difficult to face evil without some kind of psychological or theological or philosophical shield that allows us to reflect on the situation or to act as a kind of filter to the situation to add the dimension of meaning to it. So this kind of mythic imagery, this kind of mythic approach to evil is emotionally powerful. And people say it takes us beyond what can be expressed using rational thought. And that's where notions of the demonic are useful. The argument is that if we try to be too scientific in our account of evil, without using mythological metaphors, we end up being too reductive. Um, but there is also this secular point of view that wants to get rid of the notion of the devil in the sense of some kind of spiritual, hidden spiritual force that causes evil. Uh, and they just want to understand evil in terms of psychology and social science as, as a disorder or an aberration. And the word evil implies too much of a moral absolute. And in this, uh, from this point of view, evil is really just an obsolete the word evil is a kind of obsolete hangover from simplistic religious thinking. We could just say the people who hurt other people for no reason, for example, are lacking in empathy. Psychopaths lack empathy. They have no capacity to feel what other people are feeling. They have brain damage that's beyond their control, which makes evil a kind of medical problem. Severe narcissistic defenses prevent uh, empathy and so on. Um, and empathy is often suppressed. We often have to suppress empathy when we see, for example, when we see homeless people or Im other images of suffering. Um, because if we feel too much empathy for what's going on, it awakens our own suffering too much. And, and, and um, in this context, defenses are very important. Splitting, dissociation, psychic numbing make ordinary people more able to commit evil acts by reducing our empathic awareness of what we're doing to other people. If we're very self-absorbed, we are less open to the suffering of other people and the, and the evil that can result. So indifference to evil because of these kinds of splitting defenses are a huge problem. But I should say that lack of empathy is not the whole problem because there are sadistic people who do have empathy and they use their empathy to enjoy the suffering of their victim. Well, what about uh, intention and motivation? Are they important criteria for deciding if an action uh, is evil? Some people insist that to, to call an action evil, you have to have an evil intention, evil motivation. But this can cause its own problems. There were people who burned heretics or witches during the Middle Ages, during the Inquisition, in the honest belief that they were saving their souls. They, they weren't simply sadistic people. They had the best possible motivation. They thought they were acting in accordance with the word of God. They thought they were fighting evil. So this shows you how tricky a focus on motivation can be. You can commit real evil and inflict terrible suffering in the sincere belief or the illusion that you are actually doing some good. So a lot of people have given up the emphasis on motivation because in any case, an action could turn out to be evil in spite of the fact that there were no evil motivations. Um, you can commit an evil action without intending to be evil. So motivation itself is not, not good enough. Think of terrorism. Terrorists are evil from the point of view of their victims, but they regard themselves as freedom fighters or religious devotees. And from their point of view, their, their motivations are really admirable. So a lot of people nowadays have given up the emphasis on motivation and they focus on evil as anything that results in suffering. They say, let's focus on the suffering of the victim. Evil is anything that, that deprives other people 
of the basics needed to make a tolerable life, to have adequate water and food and freedom from pain and fear and, and so on. Anything that prevents one from having a sense of one's own worth and so on. Anything that prevents a person feeling that my life is worth living for its own sake. I'm not just an end for other people. <clears throat> Now, um, one of the big questions that arises in this area is the issue of can you and I commit evil? Can ordinary, just ordinary people commit evil? Or is there something psychologically extraordinary about people like Hitler or Saddam Hussein or these uh, kind of archetypal instances of evil? Um, are, they, are they really special, different in some way? Or are they just ordinary people in extraordinary situations? If so, what sets ordinary people about from the really evil ones. Were the ordinary Germans who went along with the Holocaust really just ordinary? Were they just lacking in self-awareness? Were they just lacking in empathy? Or were they fundamentally prone to violence that was released by a social phenomenon, which was the rise of the Nazis? Was the situation that the, the rise of the Nazis allowed this intrinsic or innate evil in people to emerge. Is e evil an intrapsychic potential in all of us that can be released by social factors? Uh, sometimes it's clear that social factors can break down our normal internal restraints against hurting other people. Normally we don't like to hurt other people, but there are certain situations where these restraints break down. Um, so can we attribute, for example, the Holocaust to the social and historical conditions in Germany? Could, this is an important question, could something like that happen in a contemporary society? Um, remember that um, there were ordinary middle-aged policemen who um, went about in mobile killing units in Poland and Russia, uh, becoming savage murderers of the Jewish population uh, of Poland and, and Russia. Um, uh, and they, uh, before the war, they were just ordinary, they were members of a reserve police battalion. Now these are people who were offered the opportunity to get out of this work, but very few of them actually accepted the offer to be relieved of duty. There were no consequences if they didn't want to do this kind of work, but they willingly committed massacres out of obedience to authority and peer pressure, not particularly because of hatred. Um, so what are the social factors which will allow people to commit evil? What, what are the social factors which would allow these ordinary people to become murderous killers? Well, the social scientists have done a great deal of work on this and social psychologists. Um, they point out that there are social conditions like poverty that destroy or diminish people's dignity, their happiness, their capacity to fulfill basic material needs. And these social factors will predispose to the emergence of evil behavior. Genocide is a good example. To commit genocide, and of course we've had several since the Holocaust, you have to have large numbers of the population of a country who are tacitly complicit, um, and that you have to have social conditions that allow evil to be per perpetrated. This, uh, this is called the situationist view of evil, and it says that people are socialized into committing evil. Typically, you have a social group that feels particular hardship or humiliation or threat or danger, and that produces insecurity, and that leads to hostility to whoever seems to be responsible. In these conditions, we look for a scapegoat. Tribalism takes over. Human beings are very tribal when we're threatened. We, we, we uh, make a sharp distinction between us and them, people who belong to my group and people outside my group. 
And it doesn't matter whether you d define the group by ethnicity or religion or nationality or race or political affinity or uh, there's some kind of differentiation between people that allows us to treat some people well and some, pe some people badly. And if you see others as them rather than us, this contributes, this allows violence towards other people. Whereas if you see people as us, this contributes to empathy and caring. This seems to have been an evolutionary inheritance that human beings uh, are kind of stuck with. Um, we see this very early. Uh, um, a phenom there's a phenomenon in early infancy called stranger anxiety. Um, if, you, if you look at very young babies, they don't mind who's holding them as long as they're being comforted and fed. But after um, you get to them somewhere the middle or the end of the first year, uh, babies become very frightened of people they don't know. This is the phenomenon of stranger anxiety. And it seems to be something that we've inherited so that we would stay with our own group uh, and resist other groups. It's, it's part of our... Uh, the evolution of our attachment to caretakers. Being part of a group fosters a sense of security. It fosters identity. It fosters attachment to other people. And I'm afraid we, we tend to incorporate the group's worldview into our own worldview. And of course, in wartime, typically uh, because of the propaganda that goes on in wartime, we tend to dehumanize other people and once you dehumanize other people you can treat people in an evil way they become less than human um, you 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 can think of people as inherently less than human and not deserving of humane treatment the recent example was the the bush administration which was able to mistreat captured terrorists by repeatedly repeatedly referring to them as evil doers this is the kind of us and them psychology that allows projection and scapegoating extreme nationalism allows this kind of behavior it allows it produces in-group cohesion allows you to attack the out group uh, it, allow, it enhances the self-esteem of one group, but it allows the other group to be persecuted. And part of the problem that arises at the group level is that when the group is behaving badly, the whole country or a large group, individual responsibility is, is lessened or displaced. It's not me that's doing it, it's the whole group that's doing it. Um, and then my responsibility is diminished because everybody's doing it. Now, there are individuals who can think clearly, even in group situations. Uh, there are individuals who will not participate in group evil, even at a risk to themselves. We saw that in, in the Second World War uh, among the very few people who were able to hide, say, Jewish children from the Nazis. But that they were an exceptional group of people. But, they would, but there are people like that who won't participate in, in mass violence and act with integrity. And the difficulty is none of us know how we would behave if we were in a society like Nazi Germany. Would, be one of, would, be one of that, would, be, would we be one of that few? Or would we behave like the mass of the people who just went along with the Nazis? So um, these social factors are very, very important, um, but I don't think you can explain the behavior of people who are willing to, say, kill children in a school or, or murder people in churches uh, purely in terms of social factors. <clears throat> I think you have to take into account, <coughs> pardon me, something that's going on in the individual's mind. Excuse me. But the social scientists say <clears throat> that you always have to take into account the social situation. The social scientists ask, what are the <clears throat> environmental pressures that either force people to commit evil or allow people to commit evil? There, the, some of the social pressures are obvious. There's a need for group acceptance. Um, there's sometimes obedience to authority or sometimes simple conformity to the group. Um, and these are some of the pressures that social scientists have used to explain evil behavior. 
complex social forces. Uh, we st you may be familiar with the studies of uh, Stanley Milgram and uh, Zimb at Yale and Zimbardo at Stanford. Um, oh, just briefly, um, Stanley Milgram set up a, a, a situation at Yale where he persuaded ordinary Yale undergraduates to uh, give electric, apparently they thought they were giving electric shocks uh, to to an innocent person at the insistence of an authority figure, and this authority figure was was the researcher who was standing there with a white coat uh, and, and a checkboard, uh, insisting that the student increase the level of the shocks until it was obvious that the the other person who was apparently getting the shocks was actually an actor, but the students thought they were actually administering these severe electric shocks. And two thirds of uh, Milgram's research subjects actually increased the voltage to what would have been lethal levels, indicating the power of obedience. This was one of um, the attempts to, it was done in the 60s, it was one of the attempts to try to explain the dynamics of people like the uh, guards at the concentration camps in the Holocaust. Um, who were ordered to behave in an evil way towards other people by an apparent l legitimate authority. And Milgram said that he thought that his results suggest that human nature cannot be counted on to resist the pressure of brutal and inhumane authorities. A substantial number of people will do what they're told, irrespective of their conscience, um, um, if they think there's a legitimate authority. Now, other people have said, no, what, what Milgram's experiment showed is that people like to do evil and, they, and they're just put in a situation sometimes where they're given, uh, where they're absolved of any responsibility for their uh, sadistic behavior. Other people said these uh, undergraduates were in a kind of dissociative state, which allowed them to give shocks to other people because their normal conscience was not operating. And they were willing to, uh, to do what an authority told them to do. So these are all some of the social factors. But there are also psychological defenses that are going on at the same time. If you look at people who committed atrocities in the Holocaust or in the Rwandan genocide and so on, many of them had families and they lived ordinary lives side by side with what they were doing when they were committing atrocities. Were these people intrinsically evil people or were they just capable of massive defensive operations to, to avoid feeling the harm that they were inflicting? I think they used uh, splitting defenses, dissociation, blunting of feeling, and what Lifton called doubling. Doubling is a kind of unconscious mechanism that uh, Lifton described in Nazi doctors who would go into the concentration camps and do terrible, horrendous medical experiments and then go home and live a normal family life as if they, they, the personality was doubled. So he said they had a kind of Auschwitz self and a normal ordinary self that lived a normal family life. Well, this requires massive splitting and dissociation and blunting of feeling, of course. Uh, and, lots of, and lots of people who worked in the death camps had to do that kind of uh, splitting. Uh, they had to maintain a normal family life and perpetrate atrocities at the same time. It's quite extraordinary. The same thing happened in Bosnia. There were Bosnian soldiers who did all kinds of terrible murders and sexual assault and then went home and lived ordinary family lives. It's quite extraordinary how capable human beings are of these kind of defenses. Um, it's as if one's conscience becomes disconnected from the, the atrocities that one is, one is uh, uh, perpetrating. Uh, Lifton called this a transfer of conscience. Um, now, um, I, I said I would say something about um, Jung's notion of the dark side of the self. Uh, or the notion that the divine itself might have a dark side to it. Um, and the reason that Jung was uh, able to say this is that he felt that if we talk about atrocities like the Holocaust purely in terms of human evil, we don't do justice 
to the horror and the intensity of the evil that was perpetrated. Now, you remember that he said that there is a, an intrinsic God image in the psyche, that there's an image of the divine in the psyche, or an expression of the divine in the psyche. Um, now, he thought that this intrapsychic image of the divine, the self that we write with a capital S, has to contain all the opposites. We can't think of it as only good. The Christian God image tends to be thought of as if it was only good. But in fact, Jung thought that the intrapsychic self, the God image in the psyche, the God within, has to contain all the opposites justice and injustice, good and evil, masculine and feminine, and so on, because the self is the totality of the psyche. You can't say that it's only good. So if you think uh, in the Hebrew Bible of a character like Job, Job uh, experienced divine savagery and ruthlessness, and that was what gave Jung the idea that the self has a dark side. So the experience of Job would be a mythic paradigm for the human experience of the dark side of the God image. Something like the Holocaust or the Rwandan genocide and so on would be a more historical example of the dark side of the self. And you have to, this is where Jung is incompatible with traditional Christian notions. Because in Christian doctrine, um, especially Christ is only good and evil is split off and projected onto the Antichrist or onto Satan and so on. But uh, we experience the dark side of God or what you could call the archetypal shadow as terrible destruction and chaos and physical and mental suffering, negative synchronicities, evil of all kind. And Jung protested mightily against um, St. Augustine's notion that evil was only the absence of goodness, the argument that was called the privatio boni uh, argument, that evil is just an absence of goodness. He felt, Jung felt that we have to see evil as something very positive and, and definite. The problem is if he's right and there really is such a thing as archetypal evil, it's going to be very difficult to deal with it uh, at the ordinary um, psychotherapeutic level. At best, we can try to contain it or, or hold it at bay in some way, but it has to be dealt with by a whole community. An individual couldn't cope with it. So a thing like the Holocaust is certainly an example of human evil, obviously, but it also raises major questions like where was God at Auschwitz, which has been a huge question for both Christian and Jewish theologians. What is the relationship between evil and the divine? Um, this is not the first time this question has arisen. Um, the Lisbon earthquake in 1755 caused, killed tens of thousands of people in a few minutes. And that forced a radical rethinking of uh, our, our idea of, of the divine. And I think that in our era, many people think that the Holocaust in our era is one of the events that forces us to the realization of a new God image, where Jung's notion that the God image has to have a dark side to it is very important. Um, so, the, so the notion of the transpersonal self, the self written with a capital S, makes us realize that the self is not just the principle of order in the psyche. It's, it produces tremendous suffering uh, that is beyond human understanding. And at these times, when we're faced with this kind of suffering, I guess I think that the pandemic that we're going through at the moment is an example of the dark side of the self. I, I, I don't think it's an accident that the coronavirus is a perfect mandala, a perfect sphere and that it arose from bats in the deep underground, the deep underworld, metaphorically, you know, our unconscious, obviously. Um, uh, th this produces suffer levels of suffering that uh, uh, are beyond human understanding. What do we do in situations like this? <clears throat> we have to accept that there's a transpersonal background to these kind of situations. We can't control or explain what's happening. 
we need faith, we need sacrifice on part of the ego, and we need a process of radical acceptance. We have to decide to live in spite of what's going on, and we have to try to relate to the dark side of the self. This doesn't mean acceptance in the, in the sense of trying accepting it to try to change the situation. That would not be acceptance. It means acceptance in the, in the sense that what is brought about by the self is a necessary part of our lives that we don't understand at the moment, but that we have some connection to some transpersonal intelligence behind the situation. And we have to live in harmony with it. Um, it's forcing us, to, the, the dark side of the self always forces us to take a direction that otherwise we wouldn't take but apparently it's essential. So we cannot avoid personal responsibility. We cannot avoid taking action. But we have the action that we take has to arise from acceptance and try and attempt to understand the situation rather than just anger and bitterness. The point is, if Jung is right, then evil is more than human, uh, is more than purely human. So the evil that results from the dark side of the self is really a major spiritual problem. Now, I, I uh, said I would say a little bit about um, one particular type of personality that's responsible for a great deal of evil. Uh, and I'm not going to mention any specific names, but I think it'll become obvious. I want to talk about the malignant narcissist, because malignant narcissist really represents the represent the quintessence of evil. They are the root of the most vicious destructiveness and inhumanity. Many, for example, many serial killers are malignant narcissists, people like Hannibal Lecter and Jeffrey Dahmer and Ted Bundy and that kind of person. Now we know that all severe narcissists are grandiose, they need admiration, and we know that they lack empathy. We know that they are arrogant, they exaggerate their achievements. They want to be recognized as superior. This is the diagnostic criteria. They're often, they often have fantasies of success and power and brilliance and so on. And they think that they're very special and they're very entitled. They have unreasonable expectations of favorable treatment and they, they want to be complied with. And they're willing to exploit other people in relationships because they have no capacity for understanding other people's feelings. They are often riddled with envy, but they often have a un severe unconscious shame underneath their apparent swagger and confidence and bluster, but their shame is not conscious. They have a fear of humiliation because they were humiliated a great deal in childhood. And if you challenge their surface grandiosity, um, um, what's called narcissistic mortification occurs. The, the, this sense of humiliation begins to arise and that produces tremendous rage and a wish for revenge. They need to feel powerful because as children, they were exploited. They were made to feel insignificant. So now they need to feel powerful. So what they're doing is recapitulating with other people the victimization and exploitation that they experienced in childhood. This is what I meant when I said that child abuse leads to evil behavior. And then they were the victim, now they become the victimizer. They always have childhood experiences of severe wounding, neglect, a completely unempathic parental uh, uh, surround, abandonment. And that this, because they were often abandoned, is one reason they stress loyalty. It's one reason that loyalty is very important to them. They are so precarious that they cannot tolerate any hint of criticism or disagreement. It's too unsettling. And uh, sometimes they will see criticism which isn't even there, and that makes them paranoid. Many of them have a, quite a paranoid streak in their personalities, and they can actually have micro-psychotic paranoid episodes. Um, 
during enrage attacks, during which they want to punish their enemies to avoid internal pain. This is all a strategy of avoiding internal pain. And what they do is they gather followers around them um, and they make these followers feel their own pain initially by seducing them, but eventually by hurting them. Um, <clears throat> They often regard themselves as victims of attack. They often see themselves as being attacked. And the way they behave, of course, often leads to attack. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, they will manipulate and exploit other people <coughs> for their own profit or satisfaction. And they will often show sadistic attempts to triumph over authority which I often see as a kind of revenge against uncaring or abandoning authority figures in, in childhood. They achieve a sense of triumph over their own fear and pain by making other people feel fear and pain. Um, and they have this tremendous capacity for rage and the desire for revenge at the same time. They are contemptuous of social conventions so they lie all the time, but they lie to preserve self-esteem. They're not lying for no reason at all. They commit, well, they will often commit things like burglary, burglary and um, th those kinds of behaviors. They often become leaders of terrorist groups. Um, and they will, they will rationalize their antisocial behavior. They are very good at deceiving other people, manipulating other people, and this is a tremendous advantage if you want to achieve political power. I think power for these people acts as a kind of narcotic, a kind of drug. When they're in power, these are individuals who have fantasies of omnipotence and omniscience, which are supported by the actual authority that they attain when, when they reach peer positions of political power. And what they do is they, they, they have a predilection to surround themselves with obsequious sycophants. We see this all the time. And they use their political power to support a very grandiose self-image and to defend against external criticism. And what they do is, in the right social circumstances, is they structure the external world in a way that supports their grandiosity. Now, I'm um, also interested in the fact that there are certain kinds of personality structures that are drawn to extreme ideologies like fascism. I think these ideologies actually soothe severe narcissistic wounding. Radical ideologies are comforting. The individual's pain and hatred and fury and frustration find an explanation and a reason in these kind of hateful ide ideology. I found someone to blame for what's happening to me. This, for example, is what happened to Hitler and the Jews. Um, extreme ideologies like that will help the wounded person to find an en enemy or a scapegoat, and it will fill the individual's existential internal vacuum and emptiness and provide some kind of meaning and purpose. We saw this, for example, in the case of uh, Anders Breivik. This is the man who killed 77 people in Norway, who had a far-right ideology that opposed feminism and Islam and multiculturalism. And malignant narcissists, of whom he was an example, are attracted to this kind of ideology. It allows the personality to express itself and causes tremendous evil. So ideology was central to the genocides in, in Germany and Armenia and so on. And it fits with the person's personality structure. Sadistic personalities are attracted to inhuman political ideologies. An evil ideology is used to stabilize a fragile sense of self. Now, um, uh, I want to leave some time for questioning, but I thought I would just um, um, try to talk a little bit in the last few minutes about how it is that these malignant narcissists manage to encourage a kind of personality cult um, and uh, attract people into their orbit. 
<clears throat> and I think there's a kind of range of people who get pulled into the orbit of the malignant narcissist. Um, first of all, there are a few normal people who get pulled into the orbit because they think that the, the, the narcissistic leader is uh, articulating what they believe in and maybe could make the world the way they would like it to be and so on. But normal people don't stay very long because they quickly become disillusioned. They realize what's going on and they see that the leader is really self-serving and their own values are being undermined. And um, so they leave and then they get vilified, especially if they're part of an administration but they leave because they can't tolerate what's going on. They're too normal. Then there are less healthy people who stay with the leader. Why? Because first of all, he allows them to share in his grandiosity. Uh, he allows them to be part of his self-importance. Um, and they become co-conspirators. They may have the same sense of mission as the leader. But if they don't support the leader's agenda, they too will eventually be purged. <coughs> Excuse me. Then there's a group of people around the leader who are just dependent, um, sycophantic people, and they can remain with the leader for a long time. They often will idealize the leader. They see him as somebody special, powerful, important, who can give them a sense of direction and, and soothe any anxieties that they have about what direction the world should take and so on. Um, then there are a group of people who I think are just true believers, where the leader expresses their own narcissism, their own sadism, their own paranoia, and they identify with him and they see him as their voice in the world. Some of them are authoritarian personalities. They tend to cluster around the malignant narcissist. These are people who like the clear lines of authority. They like, they like social uniformity. They don't like diversity. They don't like people who are different. They don't like racial difference, ethnic difference. They don't like minorities of any kind. They only like traditional people. They don't like people like LGBT people. Um, and they like to gravitate towards political figures who embody intolerance and a willingness to attack minority who they see as posing a social threat. Okay, I think that's all I really want to say. I thought we might stop at that point and have a discussion. Well, Lionel, thank you so much. Uh, this is all, uh, I was at Stanford when uh, Dr. Zimbardo did his famous uh, the prison experiment. Yes, I didn't describe that, but yeah, but it it, it same as Stanley Milgram and the social yeah. effect. And I have a, a <clears throat> clear memory of our dear friend Chris Downing, yeah, describing being on the streets of Berlin mm -hmm. uh, during the time of Hitler, and having a, a one parent Jewish, one parent Gentile, and this real feeling of wanting to salute yeah. the Führer. Yeah. The social pressure was the so social intense. social pressure, the peer pressure. Yeah, yeah. What I'd like yeah. to ask about, and sort of turn the table on this coin to the other side, is individuation as a process seems to suggest or imply the moral arc of the individual. And I'd love for you to sort of speak to that, if you will, on the flip side of this conversation of evil, that perhaps there is a way out, through this process of individuation, as you've suggested through the experience of the numinous, yeah. way out of this. And I recall that the Greeks had usually trilogies, and if you were a free citizen, you were required to go. So Oedipus Rex was the evil, and Oedipus Colonus was the wisdom and the quality of goodness that's potential yeah. in the human life. So could you speak maybe to the flip side of what we've been talking about here? Well, your point about individuation, I think, is very important because it's the antithesis of mass consciousness. The Jung's idea of mass consciousness was, was the opposite of individuation. Um, um, you, you, when you're part of a large group and you think like the whole group, you are, that's the anti-individuation position. So if you can individuate um, and become a discriminating individual, you won't participate in a group, except maybe under extreme coercion.
but I think you're right to to, to, to draw that distinction. Yeah, and, and, and Lao Tzu and even Aquinas suggest that it's important to draw the distinction between actual evil and potential evil. And Lao Tzu suggests that really goodness is not understood except in relation to potential evil. And so it brings back the conversation to this sense of personal responsibility yeah. and moral culpability. And, and the issue of whether people who are evil really have the choice. You see, if, you, if you're possessed by a very powerful complex, which makes you destructive and envy, envious and angry and hateful, sometimes the emotional intensity of the complex is so great that it can't be contained and it has to be enacted. Most of us whose complex, we all have complexes, but they're not usually that emotionally intense that we can't contain them most of the time. And if you can contain, then you don't, you don't become evil yourself. You may think about it, but you don't actually do it. I think it's the emotional intensity that these people suffer from, which is the, which is the vulnerable factor. You, if you're abused a great deal in childhood, so you have these destructive complexes, um, you almost always have a very fragile sense of self. And by definition, that means that you can't contain painful feelings. They ex you just explode and come undone. Yeah, and it seems that uh, many of the malignant personalities that you're referring to, especially some more contemporary, uh, people have not looked at the early childhood experience associated with those individuals. And it seems that if you're going to be a commentator, you're going to talk about the situation that uh -huh. this, you've really got to take that into account the quality of abuse or neglect that existed in early childhood. Well, we have a great deal of information about the childhood of Hitler and Saddam Hussein and people like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so we do know something about the, the childhood of psychopaths. You know, they, they were the victims of predatory parents. And then uh, in, or, in order not to become prey, they become predators themselves. Last question. What is, what is this uh, fear or this complex around diversity that seems to be associated with these personalities? It's the fear of otherness. Mm -hmm. Somehow it makes me, I need people around me who are like me in order to feel safe and secure. And if you're too different than me, then I'm afraid of you. Um, and I also need a scapegoat that I can project all my own fragility and vulnerability and I can project what's wrong with me onto you. And then I can deal with my shadow material out there. I don't have to deal with it in myself. So any kind of convenient minority or ethnic group will do. Yeah, and it seems to go back to what we talked about last week, which in relation to fundamentalism, which is do you as an individual trust reality? Is reality trustable? Is uh -huh. it individuation suggests that there's a, a powerful dimension of our psyche that is trustable. So Will, I want to turn it over to you. Uh, any questions? Yeah, you know, uh, many, um, a life, lifetime of questions, uh, but two I'd love to get to. And the first is, um, <clears throat> uh, I wonder how you would respond or what you think of people who are, uh, see themselves as uh, almost a, a higher species than humans. And you hear this language, you hear it, from the Santa Barbara shooter, who was not like a right wing kind of person, but you see all the tendencies right there in him. And what he said, and, and I want to point to the movie Chronicle, which I think is the best example of this psyche I've ever seen, where somebody comes to believe that, you know, well, we don't worry about eating cows. Why would I worry about the lesser humans that are not at my level? And you see this, for example, I love the show Billions. The guy who's the biggest hedge fund manager in the world kind of starts to show these tendencies where why do I owe other humans, you know, goodness if I see mm -hmm. them as mm -hmm. less than, yeah. yeah. Well, that kind of grandiosity is a defense against uh, unconscious shame mm. and feelings of, of uh, in all these kind of inflated nar narcissists, there's also a very wounded inner child that feels worthless and riddled with shame and envy. And um, the grandiosity will um, 
defend so that I don't have to feel that kind of internal pain and humiliation. I can be very special. Mm -hmm. So it's like they've, they've thought they've got a, a trump card to get out of the evil problem by saying, you know, but, but it's really just uh, hiding something from themselves. The other, the other question I wanted to ask about is I'd be curious to know your kind of thoughts about the Neoplatonist perspective on evil, where evil is the possible within the good and that nothing exists. So it's kind of, there's still a dualism, but the duality isn't just like evil is lack of good. And it's not just like either or one or the other. It's, it's a little bit more nuanced uh, where evil is just what's possible. And then part of the reason I bring it up is, is I think a lot about systems theory and you've got the one week link is the one thing that's going to break down and give rise to the next system, which is going to be more organized and more orderly than, than the last system. And so, you know, I wonder if there's something to, you know, evil being within the possible and the role of evil in the transformation of systems around its weak links. Well, I suppose, yeah, I'm afraid I can't really answer your question because I don't know much about systems theory. Can, um, well, let's God, just take the Neoplatonism you... thing then. You know, how do you feel about that, that idea? Evil is, is within is the, the range of possibility, but still within the good. Well, if, it, if it's within the range of possibilities, it means that we're making a choice to do it or not. And then the issue of choice has to do with the question of free will, which is the subject of a whole other conversation. Uh, and I think that evil people are so moved by these internal psychological forces, and especially intense affects like rage and pain, that they actually are not capable of making choices. Mm. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, again, it goes back to the idea of potential versus actual. The Manichaeists would see actual evil as the flip side of, of actual good. But, and that's dualism. Mm -hmm. But Lao Tzu and Aquinas and so many others, and the Neoplatonists, as you suggest, suggest possible evil or potential evil as really being the counterpoint of goodness. Huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this has been very helpful. I want to ask, has anybody written well on the malignant narcissist? Otto Kernberg, <clears throat> in his, <clears throat> excuse me, in his book, uh, I think it's called Severe Personality Disorders. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. And do we have any questions from the uh, chat room, Dana? Yes, we had one from Skylar. Um, I'll read it. Uh, what if you're just born that way and the negative childhood issues you described were not present? Um, <clears throat> well, it depends whether you believe in a, in a bad seed theory of evil, <clears throat> you know, like uh, Rosemary's baby, whether the child is the, the devil is the, mm -hmm. the, that, that child, that's a bad seed theory. You're born bad. Um, I think there are a small number of people who are born with genetic brain deficits that turn them into psychopaths. But I think there's very, there are very few people like that. Um, most people who behave in evil ways may have some brain, some genetic predisposition, but they are the victims of abuse in childhood. I think most evil is secondary to that kind of abuse. I realize that there may be a few instances of people who, because of the structure of their brain, have no empathy for other people and, and so on. But I think they're extreme rarity. Doesn't it seem that you have to have an evolved ego in order to transcend the potential for evil? Can you have an ego that has a pro has problems with it as far as having predispositions to do bad things but it's an evolved e ego yes i that's why i said i think we all have this potential in us because we all have pockets in us where we were hurt or abused and so on in childhood Mm -hmm. but we manage to contain it or restrain it. We're talking about people who, where the intensity of the feelings involved 
are so great that they can't contain it. But I think most of us have areas like that in our psyche. Yeah. In other words, it's more of a spectrum than an either or. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just one, uh, one takeaway I want to share, uh, you know, I'm always teaching storytellers, right? That's my, my student. And so I'm always listening to this stuff and I'm just thinking how incredibly valuable this would be to somebody designing characters and mm -hmm. leads me to your point about the devils and, and, you know, devils are so politicized, right? This, we, we're going to put something from Dionysus into the devil because we want to uh, repress Dionysus. And so they become compromised as personifications of evil. And mm -hmm. what, what I'm really motivated and inspired to do, I write stories a lot too, is, is be like, wait a minute, I'm not sure I do see a good personification, certainly not a good mythic personification of evil that isn't compromised by all these agendas. And I, and I don't know, I think I'd like to see what that might look like and play with that a little bit. Maybe that's dangerous. <laughs> yeah, there's been some good uh, stuff written around World War II the way in which we were demonized as a country and the way we demonized the Japanese and the Germans. And it's interesting to look at the art, Will. And again, I think Hitler's whole uh, organization, going back to systems theory, he created a mythology that allowed him to project that quality of evil out into the world. And he drew from many different places. I mean, the swastika, as we know, is a Buddhist symbol. Mm -hmm of immortality, but he used that to project his power, his authority, using the power of those myths. Maybe there is our mythic figure right there. I think that if we had to ask the war, like everybody say, write down one name, who you think is the ultimate personification of evil, I bet Hitler would take the lead over the devil or probably anybody right now. Well, it may be, but as Lionel suggested earlier, if you read his early biographies, you can see there was a young man who wanted to be a monk and then an artist and he was put down at every turn and he was whipped and beat kind of like luther <laughs> and he, was beat, he was beaten every day of his life till yeah. he was about 12 or 13. he had a severely sadistic alcoholic father yeah. but that's you see that's the abuse excuse that yeah. does not take him off the hook we have to be very careful here no, yeah, I agree. I agree. We don't want to make him suddenly. He's the victim. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah, but as, I think as, as a society, we can hold people responsible. But as individuals, we need to look at those factors and understand them in ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. So, Dana, I think we're at the time. You're on mute. Uh, does the malignant narcissists tend to be male or can can this <laughs> fall into i think mo most of the ones that we know about are male but it's but um you know some of the concentration camp some of the worst most cruel concentration camp guards were women mm. so it's certainly not confined to men but i think it's more common among men uh does women's socialization uh, does it override their tendency for violence following severe childhood abuse? Well, I don't know if I can, if, I, if one would say it always does that. Are they less likely to be physically beaten as children, percentage-wise? Mm -hmm. Probably, yeah. 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 Well, let me bring this then to a close. Got a lot to think about. <laughs> yeah, we do have a lot to think about. And Lionel, I, I think the entire community is deeply grateful for the scholarship and perspectives that you bring, uh, you bring to this. Uh, we're really honored that, uh, that you'll talk with us, to, that you'll take talks that you've had and, and preserve them in this format. Um, so I want to thank everybody for coming this morning. Uh, we're on, we're at a place where we're deciding how to go forward, uh, what talks we're going to do. So if you're on the email list, we'll send it out to you. So once again, thank you very much for coming to the talks of Lionel Corbett.
And on behalf of Dr. Gard Jamison, Dr. Will Lynn, and myself, I thank you for attending.